Okay, if you've, if you've got a Bible, can you, it's a good start. If you've got a Bible, can you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9? That is the passage that we are going to be um, kind of camping out on today. For those who don't know me, my name is Matt, one of the leaders here at Hope Church. And we are in a season where we're building up towards a giving day next week. And so next week we are going to be, we are calling you, the church, to give uh, into uh, the building project that we have going on. And a few of us, I was able to show round the bits earlier that we're doing in the building and we were able to pray upstairs. Um, there are only a few of us. So what I'm going to say is if you would like to know more about what we're doing with the building and actually have a walk around the different areas in the building, you hear us talk about phase four and kitchen, etc. Then after the service, what I'd like you to do is just meet me in that corner and I'll give you a little bit of a guided tour if you want to. But we've got a giving day next week. And so we're spending last week and this week talking a bit about money and generosity. Um, But we said last week, it's, it's not my job to persuade you to give money to me or to the church. And in fact, if you're here and you are visiting us, if you're not a regular member of this church, I don't want your money, okay? Uh, This is not asking you to give into this project at all, but I hope that actually issues of generosity and principles about that may still hit home for you. Um, But uh, so it's not my job to persuade you to give. My job as a preacher and a pastor is to hold out the truth of the gospel for you and the Holy Spirit will do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. And so last week we looked at the truth of who God is. And we saw that God at his heart, at this fundamental core of who he is, is generous. Like it's at the heart of the Trinity, you know, Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God, one God in three persons. Uh, And we, we saw that the Father gives the Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. We saw the Father and the Son together give the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us adoption into the family of God where we can call God Father. And so at the heart of the Trinity, at the heart of who God is, is generosity. God is not someone who likes to take from us, but someone who likes to give and to bless us uh, abundantly. So that was last week, who God is. Today, I want to explore what God does with our generosity. And to do that, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 9. And I've asked Camilla to come, and she's going to come now and read 2 Corinthians 9 uh, from verse 6. Thanks, Camilla. Um, but remember this, if you give little, you will get little. A farmer who plants just a few seeds will get only a small crop, but if he plants much, he will reap much. Everyone must make up his own mind as how much he should give. Don't force anyone to give more than he really wants to, for cheerful givers are the one God prizes. God is able to make it up to you by giving you everything you need and more so that there will not only be enough for your own needs, but plenty left over to give joyfully to others. It is as the scripture says, the godly man gives generously to the poor. His good deeds will be an honor to him forever. For God who gives seed to the farmer to plant and later good crops to harvest and eat will give you more and more seed to plant and will make it grow so you can give away more and more fruit from your harvest. Yes, God will give you much so that you can give away much, and when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will break out in thanksgiving and praise God for your help. So two good things happen as a result of your gifts. Those in need are helped, and they overflow with thanks to God. Those you help will be glad, not only because of your generous gift to themselves or to others, but they will praise God for this proof that your deeds are good as your doctrine. And they will pray you with deep fever, favor, further, sorry, and feeling because of the wonderful grace of God shown through you. Thank God for his son, his gift too wonderful for words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Father, we come to your words and we want to place ourselves under your words, Lord. So often we place ourselves above your word and we judge what it says. Is this something I want to listen to or not? I pray today we will place ourselves under your word. We submit to the authority of your word and we ask, Father, that you would help us to understand what you are saying to us today through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, uh, if you've been around church for any length of time, um, 
particularly if you've been out for a long period of time, you may hear that I'm preaching on those verses and get a little bit uncomfortable. And the reason you may get a little bit uncomfortable is because these verses are favoured by what teachers of what we would call the prosperity gospel. I don't know if you heard that term, the prosperity gospel. The, the prosperity gospel is a teaching um, among some uh, who, and they would say that it is God's desire and God's will that if you are a Christian, you will in this life receive health and wealth and prosperity. But it is God's will that you would never be sick. It is God's will that your bank balance would be blessed abundantly and overflowing. But it is God's will that you'll be prosperous in all things in this life. And in, in the prosperity gospel, the, the way that we access this is through faith. And faith is seen as kind of a currency. We pay God in our faith and we receive back health, wealth and prosperity. And so you go, well, how do we demonstrate our faith? The way we demonstrate our faith is in in two ways. Firstly, in our words, we make positive faith-filled declarations. I have received that promotion. I am already well in Jesus. I have been healed already. I will receive that check in the post. And you'll find that often they'll make these declarations where we uh, express our faith through our words. And secondly, the other other way is money. And you'll hear this um, often, the idea of sowing seeds. And you might hear this from the American televangelist. Sow a seed into this ministry. And that's a way of showing your faith. And what happens is as you sow your financial seed into this ministry, God will bless you with increased finances yourself. So it's like a harvest. You sow a seed and you get money in return. This is kind of a nutshell of the prosperity. So I'm trying to be as as kind of generous um, with this as I can be. And um, uh, genuinely, I, I want to kind of portray this as, as, as someone who teaches prosperity gospel want to portray it as they boil it down. And, and there are some good things about this. God wants us to be full of faith. He calls us to a life of faith. And there is a link between faith and healing. If we don't have faith that God can heal today, we're not going to ask him. And we know that if we don't ask, the Bible says we don't get So there is a link between faith and healing, and God calls us to have faith, and words express our faith. We want to positively declare the things that God has promised, and we want to to tell God back his promises, don't we? Uh, James 1 says, um, if any of you lacks wisdom, you must ask God, and God will give graciously to all without finding fault. That is a promise. He give, he will give us wisdom if we lack it. And so we can say, God, you promised that you're going to give us wisdom. So I declare and I, I trust that you're going to give me this wisdom that you declare. We, we want to um, use our words. And also our money does show where our faith is as well. Where your money is, there your heart will be. So there is truth here. But this is a false gospel. Um, now, the, the prosperity gospel teacher might go, well, it's in the Bible. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. When you sow something, you reap back the same things. If I sow money, I'm going to get money. It's a biblical principle. I want to explain why I think this is a false gospel. Um, Not not just why I think it is, why it is a false gospel. Um, The prosperity gospel essentially is based on this idea that health, wealth and prosperity is promised for now in this life. The true gospel, the gospel as we find it in the Bible, would say that health, wealth, and prosperity are promised, but they are promised for then. That there is a day coming where there will be no more sickness, where there will be no more poverty, where there will be no more suffering, where there will be no more brokenness. And on that day, we will receive all these things. They were won by Jesus at the cross, and we will receive them one day. This is the hope of the gospel of Jesus. And yes, we can receive these things now in part. He can bless us financially. And for many of us, he has. The fact that we are here in clothes, many of us able to rent houses or live in homes is a, is a testament to the blessing of God. The, the fact that many of us are healthy in some form. The fact that we have an NHS that is, yes, broken, but phenomenal at looking after us. These are blessings of God that he has given us in this life. It's not all for eternity. We see some of it now. 
but it is not promised now. And the fact is, for most Christians, for most of the world, for most of history, they have not lived in health, wealth and prosperity. They've lived on or near the poverty line. And so the problem I find with the prosperity gospel, so there is, of course, truth in it, is that it is not realistic. It doesn't make sense of how the world works. You try telling someone living in sub-Saharan Africa who lives below the poverty line that God's wish for them in this life is that they'll be healthy. They would laugh you out of the room. You tell someone whose children have passed away or have died of God, have, have suffered with chronic disease, that the reason they, don't, they haven't seen healing or they didn't see healing is because they didn't have enough faith? Wow! The blame that comes with this is astonishing. The guilt is astonishing. The prosperity gospel is at best a misguided privilege of the West and at worst is a manipulative tool used to used to get money out of vulnerable people. When you hear anything that smells of the prosperity gospel, I want you to run away. But whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Well, we, go, we know this isn't right, But it does look like it's saying it. And the principle of scriptural interpretation of reading the Bible well is that the Bible interprets the Bible. And what's really fun and really helpful for me as a preacher is if you, in your Bible, you go down just a few verses to verse 10, we get the interpretation. So verse 10, these are the key verses for us today. Now he who supplies seed to the sower And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Okay, three things really, really quickly that I want us to see from here. Firstly, God provides the seed. And it is talking about money. In 2 Corinthians at this point, the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church to give money to the church in Macedonia because they have a need. So he is talking about money. So they got that right. This seed thing here, it applies wider, but right here is talking about money. God supplies the seed. All your money comes from God. And you go, well, I worked hard for my money. I got that promotion. Yes, true. I don't want to take that away from you. But who gives you the breath in your lungs and the gifts and the ability you have to do your job well? It's God. It all comes from God ultimately. God provides the money. Well, what do we provide? Well, we provide the generosity. Look what he says. You can be generous. Doesn't say you must. Doesn't say God's going to force you to. He says you can, if you choose. It's up to you, between you and God. You can be generous if you wish. God provides the money. You provide the generosity. And what is the harvest? Righteousness. So this ain't like planting apple seeds and getting apples. We plant financial seeds And the harvest is righteousness. What God does with our money is he produces a harvest of righteousness. And what's really fun is this is a massive part of our story as a church and a story of our building as well. And so I want to interview, I'm going to interview four people over the course of this morning. And I want to welcome our first two. So if you can give a massive round of applause and welcome to Phil Edwards and Carol Swanick, everybody. It's because we're uh, old. It's because you're old, yes, correct. Um, old, uh, Carol, I'm going to start with you. Uh, how, how old? No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, just explain, just introduce yourself to people who don't know you. We've got a few guests here and maybe people haven't met your acquaintance. Uh, who are you and how long have you been at Hope Church? My name is Carol and I've been here for 31 years. 31 years. Yes. Uh, before it was Hope Church? Uh, yes, honestly, it? it was Meadows Church and I came uh, not the first week because I was busy, but I came the second week with three other ladies from St Paul's Church 
in Odeby. Uh, we've been praying for Wigston and um, when we knew that there was a church opening here, we just felt called to come and we did. And it was before Hope Church was Hope Church. It's also before Hope Church had a building. Yes. So where did we meet? In school on Meadows, Meadows School. So you remember the set up and the set down and the, all of that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How was that? Yes, it was, uh, I mean, it was just good to be together. I mean, it was just, just wonderful. Um, that there were a number of people from Night in Church who'd come, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't empty. You know, there were a lot of nice people there. And, uh, but it was small, and uh, the only thing that we could do was just have a, a, like a small Sunday school. There was, there was no, no hope of doing any, any other work there. Mm. Do you remember first hearing about this building? Yes, I do. What yeah. was that like? Oh, it's a, such a surprise. Um, I did find out afterwards that Jeff had been, been well, Jeff and the elders and uh, some of the leaders had been looking for a building for some time or either a building or a piece of land. But every door closed. There was some reason why it wasn't right. And uh, I remember hearing afterwards that Jeff had prayed that even if there was a, an old factory that closed down, and, uh, and sure enough, uh, this building came up for sale and uh, it was such a surprise. It's huge. <laughs> Sorry. And derelict. And derelict, yeah. Yes, yeah. It was an old ladies' pride building and they'd moved out. And so the place was just as it was, but without the machinery. And so it needed a lot of work doing to it. And... What was the vision that was cast at that point? Like, here's an old factory. Ladies, just for those who don't know Ladies Pride, that essentially means making ladies' underwear, right? Uh, no, I think it was uh, high-class um, clothes for, for the Italian market. Oh, Italian market. Well, I think so, yeah. Oh, stockings. Yeah. stockings. Before are, that, is that it underwear? Was. I don't know. Yeah, before the stockings. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really au fait with the in and out of <laughs> ladies' underwear, apparently. <laughs> what was the vision for the yeah. church building? What was, how was that? portray to you i think um that the the uh, the reason we wanted a building uh, was was how we wanted a place of our own but also we wanted to be a community church so we wanted a place where we could uh, we could offer um what i think um it was debbie and graham did a, a survey over the uh, community and found four things two of which were one was in a one was children's uh, um, care for children and uh, the other one was debt and two of those things came about one by the nursery that we started here and secondly uh, with cap when that started um, but they, the, the vision just just very quickly the place closed down after we had the roof repaired it closed down because uh, we didn't have the money but it was during that time that um Visiting other churches, the elders found a way forward of uh, of uh, getting money into the church through the nursery and through um, uh, hiring out rooms, and that would free up the congregation's money um, to reach out and to do the work mm. with the community. Fantastic! And how much did it cost? All it all told, one hundred ninety-five thousand to build to buy the property. To buy the building, yeah, yeah. Um, you couldn't. Uh, buy my house for that now but uh, it seemed an enormous amount of money at the time so so yeah it's 195 and do you know how much the entire thing costs all in uh up to now you are uh, when because you obviously buy the building you get a derelict two factory. two or three million i think one and a half to two yeah one and a half to two million and how big was the church back then um, we had at the beginning we had sixty members, I think. Okay, but at that point it was slightly slightly bigger than that. So you had a, a church that's probably maybe a shade smaller than we are now. Yeah. That over the course of a, a few years raised one and a half to two million pounds. Yeah. Well, in How? the be <laughs> in the beginning we had a gift day. Yeah. And uh, that uh, they they set a target and said if we could pass that target we would go for the building. And uh, it raised one hundred and forty-six thousand pounds with gift aid. That just that one gift aid, and then f further to that, people pledged money, 
and because uh, we had to borrow some money, but that was quickly paid off because people people pledged money to pay monthly, and so so that's how that first part came about. So that came as as a gift aid, and that must have meant people gave incredibly sacrificially. They did, yes. Do you have any? Tell us about that. Yes, I do. Um, there was one one couple that I know of who were planning to have um, extensive work done on their house and gave that up to give the money to the church. There was a, a guy here who had a, um, a wonderful model railway and he sold it to give the money um, for the church. And um, But, you know, second to that, you know, there were people who just gave out of what they could mm -hmm. but there was was some very sacrificial giving and um but I, the, the thing I, I was talking to pete and i put it that we had a shared vision that we were it's we were all together we wanted this we wanted to see the work go forward mm -hmm. we wanted to building and so we were prepared to give that money um uh, Pete said it was like we were all together as one. We were all moving forward as one and wanted to do whatever we could mm. to acquire this building. And if I may, I just wanted to... Uh, it reminded me this morning of um, what it said in Acts 2, where it said all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And I felt that that's, that's very much how we were at that time. We all shared the vision that we wanted to, to uh, have a place where we could be what we wanted to be, which was a community church. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, Phil, um, introduce yourself and, and tell people a little bit about your role here at the church. My name's Phil. Um, Phil and I'm Mark Lynn over there. And we've been at the church since 2010, so 14 years mm. Um, in 2013, I retired from Rolls-Royce early, unexpectedly, um, and also became an elder in the church. And then in 2014, I was asked to lead the church. And, um, and that was very interesting because I was also leading the church, but also taking on the building itself as well. Because the church had, as a charity, obviously, and, and a church, we also had a business called TKC Leicester Limited, and that was separate from the church and a separate charity. And we ran the business, and the business had the, ch the nursery, and, the, and we rented out rooms, and we were raising um, enough money to pay for the building so the church didn't have to fork out around about £20,000 a year just to run the building um, and to improve it slightly. Um, so that was quite a mixed role I had. Um, it was interesting. We, we, um, it became clear that, that the vision that the church originally had, which was to be a community centre, um, which well, the, the nursery was there, that all these things were slightly changing. But we still had a lot of activity in the church, so we rented the rooms out. People came in, like NHS, um, health, um, young offenders, uh, lots of charities, um, Leicestershire, Leicestershire County Council, Leicester County, uh, City Council, lots of training went on. And then, of course, the church was running TOTS, and Leslie was running tr TOTS in here in this, uh, in this room, or next door, actually, in the, in the coffee lounge at that time. And uh, we had CAP. The CAP office was here. Um, and then we had things like the Tuesday um, Craft Club and other things going on. And all of these things grew. But there was a bit of a tension because um, obviously the business were using all the rooms during the week, which was great for the building, but it meant the church was slightly restricted in what they could do during the week. So COVID changed everything. Um, when COVID hit uh, and after COVID was, was almost finished, we realized that actually the business wasn't going to, it was going to lose money. And the church would have to fork out and lend money to the business to, to restore it again. And we felt that was God leading us to change um, and have another vision. And that is to, to actually stop the business 
Unfortunately, we had to make 13 people redundant. And it was quite a tough time, but the vision was there for us to use the building for the church in a much more um, intensive ministry way, if you like. Because although it was great renting the rooms out and it was wonderful having the nursery and having all the activities the church were putting on, uh, the wonderful thing was that about, I reckon, about 300 different people came through here every week. Wow. And so we were known in the community. We were known everywhere in Wigston as the King's Centre. But strangely enough, not many people knew there was a church in the building. So we hadn't got that quite right. So to actually close the business and to be more demonstratively a church showing Jesus to the world it was actually a really good move. Yeah. And of course, since then, we've, we've had Hope Hub on a Thursday. We've had the lunch club on a Tuesday. We've had uh, those doing ministry in Jesus' name, using us as officers, and uh, lots of things have, have moved on. What's your hope for this building moving forward? Well, my hope is that, again, that um, we are known within the community and the community are engaged with us in so many different ways with the opportunity that they can see Jesus in us. We were praying this morning and I was thinking this morning, you know, when, when they built the temple, it was everywhere was covered in gold and there were jewels and precious stones everywhere. And, and of course, we don't need that today. We just need a basic building, the gold and the gems and the beauty comes from us. Wow. And I think that's, that's what I want. I want people to be still engaged with us, not just as a building, but as a church, to know we're here and to recognize that we're different yeah. and to want what we've got. Yeah. It's interesting that when we were um, renting out the rooms and running the nursery, so many people who came into this building just for a training course would say, it's so peaceful. This building is so peaceful. Now, you can't read too much into that, but I believe there is something to be said for the fact they actually sensed the presence of God yeah. here. And we want that to be more, um, more direct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Bless you guys. Come on. Maybe that was the first time you were hearing some of that stuff. Um, the, the, if you were here during when the building project was going on um, originally, can you just pop your hand up? Okay, keep your hands up. If you want to know more, ask these guys, because they'd love to talk to you about it, I'm sure. What we've seen then is that people sowed seeds, and the harvest we have reaped is a harvest of righteousness. People gave sacrificially. They sold their trains. They cancelled work on their house. I mean, this is big stuff. And what we've seen is 25 years of gospel ministry in various forms of people knowing this building, of coming in, of being blessed and receiving a whole load from God. And this is what we see in, in our passage. Like This is our, our passage. Um, what does a harvest of righteousness look like in this passage? Well, it looks like the people of God abounding in every good work. When we give generously, that is a good work, but it also means that good works can happen through the money that is given. It means the poor are blessed. How many people struggling financially have been blessed because of the money given, because we have this building that we can work out of? How many in the future? Um, that God is praised, that God is thanked, that God has been glorified by a worshipping community in this building and by people looking on. But not just people in this church giving glory to God. Look at this. Others will praise God. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, with a vision for this building, I don't think they had you in mind. They didn't know you. They didn't know you existed, many of you. Certainly they didn't know I existed. And yet we have been blessed through the giving that has enabled this building to be used. As we look at giving in the future now, I wonder how many people in 25, 30 years time will be blessed because of the giving that you're going to give. Others will praise God. And then fifthly, it demonstrates obedience. As we give generously, we are obeying God. This is some of the things the harvest of righteousness looks like. I don't know, as we talk about a building project and, and giving next week, I don't know 
what the harvest of righteousness will look like. But I have some ideas. And my friends have some ideas. And so I'd love to welcome up a couple of those. Um, Katie and Sally, if you would come up, that would be great. Give them a round of applause. Who wants to go first? Sally's come prepared, so Sally can go first. Why the chairs are hanging. Yes. Now, Sally, I know this is a big deal for you to be up on stage because you don't actually like that. And I've kind of, I haven't twisted your arm. I've asked you. Um, this is you to hold. I want you to hold it about there, if that's right. Just a bit close to you. There, there you go. Um, but it, I think it shows how much you are excited about this that you're willing to, to share. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've lived on the Meadows Estate. I've lived on the Meadows since the other side of the Sywell Drive had cows on it. There was no Sainsbury's, no Iceland in Wigston. There was no Harcourt Estate. There was no Wigston Meadows. I'm going to hold this for you. There you go. And I've lived in the same house for so long that if you actually um, told the story, including mine, yeah. on the road, we could make Coronation Street look like Noddy. <laughs> So you've lived on the Meadows a little, a little while. And um, anyone who speaks to you for any length of time will know that you have a heart for Wigston. Tell me, what is your heart for Wigston? You need to go back a bit. I come from Hull. It was grotty. It was awful. When I was 18, I got a map of England. How far was far enough to move away before I actually did things that people shouldn't do? And I came to Leicester, I hadn't a clue who I was or anything else about me. And it was a year later, I was at a camp in Sidmouth. I went to a church and God spoke to me through a hymn. And my parents told me I was a Bible thumping idiot. Well, my brother told me I was a Bible thumping idiot. My parents told me it was a teenage phase I'd go through. And it was a result of Dave Burke coming to open this building and spoke at night and the night before that my parents in the 80s came to faith. Wow. And I said to my parents, why now? And my mother said, don't you think we've been watching you hanging on to God by the skin of your teeth? And I look back and we've all got a story. And some stories are horrible and they hurt and we're in pain and it's grotty, but God's got a bigger story. So I'm here now because you couldn't make this one up. I was in Chess Cathedral in, on March the 8th of 2019 with a friend and this non-English lady came to me. We were only gone into shelter from the rain and she put a hand on my shoulder and prophesied over me. Oh! And she said, I had to move into the community, leave her at my comfort zone and get stuck in. Here I am. <laughs> Okay. And so your heart is for people. So, so the least, the last, yeah. and the lost to so get them up and over. How else are they going to get there? So you've got Hannah over there. Hannah spoke at the meal a while ago. The next day I'm in Leicester and this little wibbly wobbly old lady says to me, Sally, Hannah's talk took my heart. That's what we're here for. Yes. We're not here to be the big oars. We're here to get alongside the people who need it. Fantastic. I think I know why I don't get you up on stage, Sally, because if I do, I'll be out of a job, I think. <laughs> um, I want to talk about our kitchen. Yeah. I want you to talk about our kitchen. What's the problem with our kitchen? Hold that from there. <laughs> Don't hit me. <laughs> These were the, the friendly halogen hob. And here we were this February. Hannah's lovely friend came to fry the pancakes. Oh, the halogen friendly. They wouldn't work. We've got 50 people waiting for pancakes. It was an absolute embarrassment. It was awful. We're not doing them next year if there's no kitchen there with a cooker suitable. <laughs> I can't do it. So <laughs> we need the kitchen. 
we need to be bigger. Debbie Hill did a meal a year last December, Christmas Day meal for people who needed friendship and a meal. It was a real struggle. Yeah. It was really hard work. We need it bigger. Yeah. And if you can put the thing on the screen. Yes. Can you put the next picture on the screen, Katie? Is that right? Yeah, it's on. I'll point for you. <laughs> come, come. This is God's biggest story. This. Oh! That's Sue Renton. She runs the social prescribers. Oh! There she was, hearing the gospel. We had to borrow this church because we got no facilities here to do it. We had to take people by minibus. Oh, the minibus let us down, we had to hire one. This gentleman is now in a care home. This lady here comes to the coffee morning. On Wednesday, it's her 70th wedding anniversary. This gentleman here is now on the ward where Rob Smith is in hospital. And you look around here, these people come to the hub club. This lady comes to occasional things. This lady helps at the coffee morning. And you look at these people. These, this man, oh, Pete Owers, he had him for cap. We've got to get alongside ordinary people. We did that meal for two pound a head. We're now paying 800 pounds for Connors to bring us meals in. We can't do it. <laughs> Sally, ladies and gentlemen. Stay there for a second. How on earth do we follow that, Katie? I don't know, I think um, I should have gone first. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, tell us a bit about you and your role. Um, so off. I'm the team leader of the kids and youth teams. Um, and my job is to put on opportunity and groups uh, for opportunity for the kids and youth to hear about Jesus. Thank you. In a nutshell. Um, and thank you, firstly. You do an amazing job. Thank you. I mean, yes. Um, and you've been in post for a couple of years now? Yeah, two years now. And you've been talking to me about phase four for about two years. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Why? Um, because every Sunday there's like, on average, about 22 primary school age children. And we all cram into, I don't know if you've been upstairs, but that room with the sofas in it. And we push all the sofas to the back and we all cram in there and we try and have like as much fun while we learn about Jesus as we possibly can. Uh, but it's really hard because it's a really small room. Um, and we start off all together and we have a lot of fun together because you can do more things with more children. It's like a lot more fun. It's, we can play games and have quizzes. I'm sure you experienced the quiz on the park uh, <laughs> this last summer. Um, but then we split into two groups and um, half of them go into the sports hall, which um, during the week has got the amazing work of the Hope Hub. Um, and Paul Marilyn has to push everything back and leave us half the sports hall to run a, one group in there and one group in where we've got the sofas as well. And it's really hard work um, trying to cram all children into that room. Children with lots of energy that could do with more space um, to have more fun as they encounter Jesus and learn about him. Um, so, yeah, that's basically why I've been uh, going on about phase four. Um, and, and then the other thing, like, let's not forget the teens, there's the, all the young people and they meet um, every other week on a Sunday and they're currently using the coffee lounge and the second nursery room. And again, there's about 20 young people on average that come on a Sunday uh, for their groups. So they're splitting between these groups, uh, trying to work in the coffee lounge and trying to work in the uh, second nursery room. Again, lots of energy, trying to put on activities where they can learn more about Jesus and encounter him. And it's just really hard to to do that in a small space so imagine that space upstairs phase four and obviously you want to use it on a sunday but what is just dream a little bit about your heart for that space um well with 22 kids in primary school age we split into two groups and there's probably like 11 or 10 11 i can't do the maths 10 11 12 in each group um on average and um ideally we'd probably want one more group of that like we'd want to split into three groups ideally because you know the smaller the group the more you can speak to them about jesus the more that they can hear and take in the less distractions from each other and 
at the moment, that's just not possible. There's no more vacant rooms. Like, we're literally stuck to two rooms. And so if I was to dream of a big area where we could, um, you know, partition it a bit and... Um, you know, also we've got to keep to safeguarding and stick to two adults. And that would give us the opportunity to be able to spread adults across the groups as well and have more groups and just have more time with them uh, to tell them about Jesus. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Katie. So that's just a few ways that giving might might increase a harvest of righteousness. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, what's going to, what God's going to do over the next 30 years. But I know this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. The fields out the back of our home, out the back, back of the Meadows Estate, we, we um, watch them go through a cycle every year. And what the farmer doesn't do when it's time to sow is he doesn't go out with a bag and just chuck a few seeds out because he knows if he chucks a few seeds out, he's going to get a few, a few plants grow. What he does is he gets a massive, great big tractor with a massive, great big seed drill, and he drills seeds into every available square inch of that field. And the result is it looks like this. I want us to receive everything that God has for us. I want us to be able to give everything that God has for us to give away to the community so that we can see a harvest of righteousness here in Wigston, that we can see his kingdom come and his will be done in greater measure, that more people can encounter God in this building and through people who are equipped from this building. That's what I want to see. And that is why we're doing this. This is not just about a building. This is about the kingdom of God in my mind. And so here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to be for the last five minutes, I'm going to be really practical. Okay, these are practical details. Uh, it's basically glorified notices, but that's, that's fine. Um, under your chairs, under every other chair, there's one of these. This is a pledge form. So we're not asking for your money right now. We're asking for you to pledge. And what I want for you to do is, we, we told you about this before the summer. So hopefully you've been thinking about this and praying about this, but you now have one week. I would love for you to go away. And with your household, I would like you to pray about how much the Lord is asking you to pledge. And you've got your name and your mobile number and email address. And what will happen is you'll um, tomorrow or next week during the worship, we'll have an opportunity during the worship to give and put our pledge forms in a box. Um, and what we'll do is at an appropriate time, we will get in touch with you and we'll ask you if you're still able to cash in those pledges and we'll provide you with the details then of how you, how you do that. And you can pledge um, a one-off lump sum. You can pledge as a monthly or a weekly or a quarterly gift, whatever it is. Um, or you can do both. You can say, actually, I have a, a lump sum of this amount, and I would like to also do that, and I'd like to give monthly. But what I would say is this needs to be over and above for your current giving. Um, and the reason I say that is because it would be great to have a lovely building, but it wouldn't be great to have a lovely building and not be able to run the church. <laughs> so we do need to, to do both. And so bearing that in mind, um, there's a box to tick there just to say that you are able to claim gift aid. Um, that, that means that you pay tax, essentially. If you pay tax, you're eligible to claim, for us to claim back gift aid. That means 25% extra on what you give gets to the church because we have to claim back your tax from the government. So if you were to say, I want to give £1,000, we would be able to claim another 250 back from the government. But you need, to have been able to, you need to have paid that much in tax for you to claim it. So if you haven't paid £250 in tax and we claim back £250 in tax, then you will owe the government, okay? So you need to do a little bit of maths this week to see how much tax you've paid, look at your pay slips, um, and to see how much, whether you are, uh, is, you're able for us to claim back gift aid on that. So I will leave that with you. Um, I can't do that for each one of you, and Pete can't do that for each one of you. So I need you to have a, a, a think about that. And obviously take into account anything you've already given and any gift aid we've already claimed back on your gifts. Uh, if you are someone who has a business, owns a business, and you want to give corporately, um, then I would, I would love for you to do that. Come and chat to me about that if your business wants to give. Um, but this specific thing is for you personally. Um, and so we will keep a record of anything your businesses want to give um, separately. Um, this is for your personal giving. And if you've already told us um, how much you're giving, uh, or if you have already given, because some people have jumped the gun a little bit, which is great, um, then please still put that on those pledge forms, because it's just easier for us to know how much um, in total to expect to come in. I want to be really honest with you. 
Not all the money that you give is going to come to the building project. 90% of it will. We want to be generous as a church. And it's our calling to not just... Um, to not just be generous individuals, but as a church. And so we have decided that whatever money comes in from the giving, from the pledges next week, we want to get, we want to tithe that. And so the two projects we've chosen is we want to give 5% of what comes into Life Church, Lutterworth, to help them as they plant and establish a work there. And we want to give 5% to Sapphires, which is a charity working with people in the sex industry in Leicester, reaching out with the love of Jesus to them. They have a £44,000 to raise on a van appeal so they can do their work more efficiently. And we want to 5% of whatever comes in from you guys will go to them. So if the building's not your thing, maybe these things are and you want to give anyway. I don't know. Okay. The only other thing to say is if this has prompted you, oh, I'm a member of this church and I'm not yet giving the regularly to this church, then I've got some gift aid forms for you and they're over by the box over there. So I, I want to take the advice just to prompt you to do that. Maybe you've gone, oh yes, I'm going to start giving and it never actually happened. Well, consider this your prompt. A lot of info. We're going to send an email later today with that, that info in as well, just because I know you may have forgotten. But... I want to bring it back before we get the kids in and finish off by lifting the roof with build your kingdom here. I want to bring it back to a story Jesus told. He told it and it's, it's recorded in three parables. So you know, it's important. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants. It becomes a tree so the birds come and perch in its branches. The kingdom of God starts small and grows big. Uh, by the way, if you go, oh, I can't give X amount of money. If you can give one pound, if you go away and pray and God says, I want you to give one pound. And if that is sacrificial for you, please come and give your one pound. Because that's what Sam was talking about earlier. This is between you and God, not between you and me or between you and anyone else. God takes small things and he grows them into big things. And the smallest thing that grew into the biggest thing is the kingdom of God started with one man who came. Jesus, who died on a cross for our sins, who was sown like a seed into the ground and out of him sprouted something beautiful. The kingdom of God that is advancing across the world. And so if you are here today, and I know that we've talked a lot about money. If you are here today, and you have never put your trust in Jesus. If you have never said, I want to follow you. I want to receive the forgiveness that is only available through you. I've, I want to live life for and with you. I want to be part of this tree that is growing and expanding and is going to fill the universe. I want to be part of your kingdom with you as king, Lord Jesus. Can I say, please, choose today to give your life away, to follow and love and serve Jesus. And I promise you, if you sow your life to love and serve and know Jesus, you will receive way more than you ever give away. And you can just speak to any one of us here who know and love Jesus and ask them about that.